You're listening to Lead to Soar, bringing women the best career advice and mentorship from around the world. Lead to Soar is a production of A Career That Soars. Learn more at leadtosoar.com. What comes to mind when you think of the word leader or the word leadership? Perhaps you might think of words like communicator, inspirational, confident, visionary, empowered, empowering. There are lots of words that describe leadership, but today Mel and I are going to talk about why the descriptions that you might have used and that you might have heard about or read about are incomplete. They're not wrong, but they're incomplete. So let's talk about leadership and let's talk about what's missing. Mel, let's have a chat. Hi, Michelle. I'm so glad to be back recording with you for our new season. As am I, Mel, and I'm really glad that we're taking the time to revisit one of the most core, fundamental, important things about the work that we do here in Lead to Soar and in our community and, of course, in the work that all of us do to close the global leadership gap. Absolutely. And we were talking offline before about revisiting this topic because we know we have new listeners coming in. Thank you so much for joining us, new listeners. We want to make sure we're giving you the foundational piece the main thing that runs through as a thread in all of the episodes that we do, which is our definition of leadership. So returning listeners, thank you for joining us. We're going to have some new things for you in this episode as well. Let's dive in. Let's talk about leadership and the missing 33%. Yeah. So Mel, what I think would be useful is if I'm going to ask you to recite, I can't think of a better word at the moment, but recite our three-part leadership definition. And then I think what would be useful is if I break that three-part leadership definition down for folks, and then let's talk about what might be missing. It'll be missing, and we'll explain more about what's missing. So leadership is. All right. I'd love to. So leadership is using the greatness in you to achieve and sustain extraordinary outcomes by engaging the greatness in others. So as Michelle said, it's got three parts. The first part is using the greatness in you. Number two, achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. And number three, engaging the greatness in others. I often say when I'm I'm talking about this leadership definition in the workplace programs that I run for women leaders, That definition is easy to say, and it's certainly easy for us to say because we live by it. It's our our mantra of leadership. But what does it actually mean? So when we break it down, let's go part by part. Number one, using the greatness in you. It means showing up, showing up in service of your strengths, your characteristics, your attributes. It means enhancing your, your leadership presence. It means being inspiring and ambitious for yourself and for those that you lead and your organisation. And it means leading in alignment with your values, your worldview and your purpose. And often when we talk about leadership, those are often the descriptors around that, that they're often the things that we hear the most. That's leading from personal greatness. The second part of the definition is achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. And This is a really, really important part of the definition, which will enlighten you why. For for return listeners, you know why. It means that you understand and you execute your positional purpose. What's your positional purpose? Put simply, it's why your company pays your wage. What are you paid to do around here? It means how are you taking your business forward? And it rests on a foundation of your business, strategic and financial acumen. So... In other words, it's your responsibility to deliver against your KPIs to take the business forward. So that's the second part. And then the third part of the definition is engaging the greatness in others. And that means seeking out and engaging the best 
in the people around us, whether it's the people we lead, the people we're led by, because yes, we can do it upwards as well, our colleagues, our peers, our customers and our suppliers. It means using creativity, compassion, team spiritedness, um, inclusion, which is obviously very near and dear to our hearts, and using your executive communication and strategic networking skills to capture the hearts, the minds and the efforts of other people and then aligning them towards the goals. So that's the three parts, Mel, but there's some stuff missing, isn't there? Not from our three-part definition, but from a lot of other stuff. Yeah, so there is a piece of the definition that we have found is missing in the leadership advice, guidance, and mentorship that women receive. And what we've found, what Susan Colantuno identified all those years ago, is that this gap in learning and mentorship is what holds women back very often from achieving the highest level of leadership that they could reach in an organization. Yeah. And, you know, I actually want to be really clear about this achieving and advancing and accomplishing. What we're talking about here is we have a global problem, which is we simply do not have enough diversity in leadership positions around the world. We do not have enough women, women of colour, women who are from the rainbow community, women who are from the the disabled community, and and so on and so forth. We have a largely homogenous group of people running the world, which is not the right thing to do. And for any of you who pay attention to the mega trends, and particularly those around ESG, environmental, social and governance trends, so things that investors and boards analysts pay attention to, you'll know that gender equity and gender in leadership and diversity in leadership is a hugely strategic goal and also a problem for for many organisations. So why we're talking about this and why we're talking about closing the leadership gender gap is because it's good for women, it's good for business, it's good for society, it's good for economies. So I digress. So I want to be really clear. This is really important that we close that leadership gender gap. Yes, all of you are going to have different levels of ambition and aspiration, but the reality is we want you to live a prosperous life well lived. And part of that is increasing your earning capacity by moving through your career at a more accelerated pace than women currently do. Okay, down off my soapbox now, Mel, about why we do this. So the reality is that there are reasons why we have a global leadership gender gap. One is because we've had systems and processes that simply haven't been evaluated and redesigned to make sure that all people, all humans, no matter how they identify, have the opportunity, equal opportunity or equitable opportunity to achieve their full potential. The second part is that we have bias or mindsets, discrimination. So we have groups of people in power who, and you've heard it, whether it's unconscious bias, conscious bias, overt discrimination, whatever it may be. So the mindsets and the bias of managers is the second reason. The third reason is that women, they either don't have or they're not effectively demonstrating the skills required to ascend to senior, executive, C-suite and beyond roles. And those skills are super, super important. I want to add here the skills we're talking about associated with achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. These are skills, which means you can learn them and develop them. So even if you don't have them now, or if you have them and you're not yet demonstrating them effectively internally to be seen, it's all skills that you can develop and it's precisely what we focus on. It's what we have an emphasis on in our network and on the podcast. Absolutely. And I'm a living, breathing, walking, talking example of leadership learning never, ever ends. Even 18 years ago when 
I thought Excel spreadsheets were things to put pretty patterns into. You would say my financial acumen was pretty low. I am now a very, very astute commercial manager. So everyone can learn, folks. So what are the skills? The skills are associated with having and demonstrating business strategic and financial acumen. And we call these the missing 33%. They're missing in a whole range of different ways for some women those skills are missing in them. They don't have them. And as I said, I'm a good example. My financial acumen some years ago, nearly two decades ago, was almost non-existent. So we might not have them or we might have them, but we're not effectively demonstrating them to those that matter, the stakeholders that matter in our organisations. And those are the people who are making decisions about our career movements. And then, of course, we also may encounter bias and things like that. But what we're talking about is women having and demonstrating these skills. But what else is missing, Mel, which is still frustrating to me, and I must admit, I have just spent the last two days sculling around on the internet looking at content designed for women. And what is missing from content designed for women, whether it is leadership summits, conferences, books, magazines, websites, Mentoring, coaching and training is how to develop your skills, how to develop your business strategic and financial acumen skills. So the advice given to women is largely missing the critical components for advancement. And when I say critical, let me give you some statistics. When people are being considered for as high potential or part of your group talent program or high profile mentoring or for promotions, 50% of the criteria evaluated for readiness is around business strategic and financial acumen. So if women aren't receiving advice, coaching, mentoring, training, et cetera, around business strategic and financial acumen, but it's 50% of the requirements to move into senior and executive roles, well, hello, this is why we have a gap. So what we want to do is close that gap by giving women access to these critical learning moments around having and demonstrating their business strategic and financial acumen. What occurs to you when you hear me talk about that, Mel? And I know this is not new territory for both of us, but what do you feel when you hear me talking about those things? Well, there's a few things that come up for me. One of the things is that I can see in the women that I've worked with that they have received bad advice, which comes in different forms, right? One way that comes up is this notion of be quiet, put your head down and work hard. And eventually someone will recognize your hard work and that will get you advancement. And we've called bullshit on that in one of our other episodes because I think the title of it from memory is your hard work is not enough or your good work is not enough. Right. That's a myth. It's simply not true. And it's not true for a couple of reasons, right? So one of the big reasons is that earning an advancement means that you're already demonstrating to the superiors who get to make the decision that you have what it takes to lead at the next level. So doing a really good job in your current role is not enough to take you up the ladder. This is just connected to what you were just talking about when it comes to what is considered when someone gets selected to advance to that higher level. And a good portion of it is going to be how you contribute to the business, the business of the business. Absolutely. And if people are wondering about where women are seen as having strengths versus weaknesses, this is an area. So I know from the work that I do with a range of my colleagues, including Susan Colantuno, this has been research conducted for 20 years. We know that if there were two candidates presenting themselves and both had really strong business strategic and financial acumen, the differentiator is engaging the greatness in others. The person who has the ability to capture the hearts, minds, efforts of others and align them towards achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes, she's the person who's going to get the gig. 
And I say she very, very deliberately because in in terms of our three-part leadership definition, there are many, 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 many articles that say women outperform men consistently in the elements of capturing the hearts, minds and efforts of other people. What they don't necessarily do is align them though. Let's add another layer to this because you and I consume a lot of content around leadership from different places. And Harvard Business Review has published a couple of times, their headline is something to the effect of how women outrank men in most leadership metrics according to their managers. So pay attention to the language there. They're using the word leadership. So they're saying women outrank men in leadership according to their managers. And the last article that said this was written by two men. So when you dig into this, it's really important to audit. What are they talking about? And if you look through the list of metrics that they're talking about, most of them have to do with using the greatness in you and engaging the greatness in others. And indeed, what we find when we audit things like leadership training programs, it's much the same thing. There's an emphasis on using the greatness in you and engaging the greatness in others and almost nothing, sometimes zero modules or lessons on deploying your business strategic and financial acumen in service of the organization. Which is really frustrating because after all this time, we still have, as you said, Mel, these articles being published and people of all genders being baffled and surprised about why, if women are so great, uh, why we haven't got more of them leading our countries, leading our businesses, leading our sporting organisations, so on and so forth. And the reality is it's, we don't find it baffling because, because of those three layers, the things that hold women back, but most particularly in the context of what we do is that we simply haven't given women the opportunity to develop and demonstrate those critical skills. And part of that demonstrating is showing up in the right way, using the the, the language of power, the language of business, being able to network strategically and tap into strategic networks to take the business forward, so on and so forth. So it's really, really frustrating at this point. Anyway, we're not here to talk about our frustration. What we're here to do is say there is a call to action. And the call to action, number one, is well, obviously keep listening to us because this does form the cornerstone of what we do. Number two is start auditing. So for every woman listening right now, I'd like you to think about the career development and the career advice and the books and the conferences and and what have you that you went to perhaps in 2022 or earlier. Now I'd like you to really critically look at those experiences and say, how much of it was around developing these critical skills that I need to go forward? Okay, I've got a couple places I want to go. I just want to do one more. And if you're a leader of women, I want you to do the same about your own approach to advancing women in your organisation. Are you giving them the conventional wisdom, which is about support and encouragement, and add a girl, and yay, you go for it, Or are you giving her the opportunity to develop and demonstrate the way that she can help your business grow and move forward sustainably? So there's two calls to action. One as an individual, one as a leader. It's really, really important because we've got to stop this. In fact, we've got to start, start this, start addressing what we call the missing 33%. Mel, over to you. Okay. Let's just say very briefly, it's called the missing 33% because it's one third of the three-part leadership definition. It's what's missing in the advice, guidance, training, mentorship that women traditionally are on the receiving end of. Where I want to go next is I want to have a, a candid moment here of just being really honest about the fact that perhaps this isn't a very sexy message. If I were hearing this for the first time and Maybe I'm the type of person who feels intimidated by numbers, et cetera. And somebody over here is telling me, you have got to get really good at the business of the business, including the finances and strategy and long-term planning. I might feel a little trepidation around 
it's overwhelming or, you know, I'd much rather spend money on a spa day or focus on some other fluffy aspect of life. And we have to get around that, right? Mm -hmm. This is important for so many reasons. It's not just advancement. It's, it's not just you as an individual. It's all of us collectively. It's getting to equity in different levels of leadership and certainly in the highest level leaderships. This is across businesses, nonprofits, the political world. We just don't have gender parity in any of these places. And we have to do the work to earn our place to get there. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. It, it, it isn't something that's sexy because we've been socially conditioned as women. Let me be clear, folks. I am generalising, making massive generalisations. I want to give myself a free pass by saying not all men, not all women. So let's assume that, you know, take that as read. But I've been working in this space for a long time, both in my executive career as well as now as an entrepreneur. And I know that women are conditioned to show up to certain things and conditioned not to show up to certain things. And I'll ask you to reflect right now, dear listener, if I was running a program and let's say you go, oh, I'd love to work with that Michelle Redfern and I'm running a program called Metrics That Matter and it's all about building your financial acumen, would you go, all right, I cannot wait to go to that. Versus if I was running an expo on, I don't know, other stuff about my authentic leadership and my personal brand. I've got to say, I also do that as well. But yeah, Mel's making little vomiting noises. But, you know, which would you turn up to? You would probably turn up to the authentic leadership, personal brand, how to win friends and influence enemies. Build my confidence. Build my confidence. Oh, yes. How to be more confident. Some of the stuff that we're doing is hard because we don't get women showing up. Now, let's assume you are going to show up and you're going to show up by listening to this podcast because we're going to tell you, we share our advice, our own experiences, the experiences of others, and of course, lots and lots of research about how to nail it at work. And you know what nailing it means? It means reaching your full potential, your full social, economic, political, and health potential. And I particularly want to focus on economic. I don't want any more women of my age, because I'm over 55, I don't want any more women of my age being confronted with poverty and homelessness. And one of the most horrifying statistics right now is that women my age are the fastest growing group of homeless people. And it's because over a lifetime of caring for others, working part-time, supporting others, being a spouse or parents, they have put their own careers, their own development, but their own earning, their own wages on a back burner. And they get to a point in life where they have not got enough money to retire. They get divorced and get wiped out or, 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 or so on and so forth. And they simply don't have a nest egg. They don't have enough earning capacity or those, you know, the, the savings. We know that, that women retire with hundreds of thousands of dollars less in their pension or their superannuation than men do because of a lifetime of earnings inequity. One of the many reasons we get so passionate about this subject is we're not seeking power and money for power and money's sake. In fact, we should, but anyway, we're seeking it so that women can be secure and have choice. Listeners, did you hear what Michelle just said? Women hitting retirement age and having hundreds of thousands of dollars less than their male counterparts. And you are expected to live on average how many more years than men? 10 to 15 years longer than men. Less money and you've got to make it last for an extra 10 to 15 years. Do you think that's going to work for you? Yes, it is the right thing to do for business and for society to have greater diversity in decision-making roles. But gee whiz, it's a must for women. Here's the flip side. When women are reaching their earning potential, 
they spend more. They spend more on their families. They are greater at philanthropy than their male counterparts. Women give more to causes than their male counterparts do. It's a really interesting uh, article from Sally Krawcheck just in the last few days around the pattern of philanthropy. We put more into the economy. Women make 85% of consumer buying decisions in the home. When women earn more, they will put more money into the economy. So women are better off. Their families are better off. Society is better off and the economy is better off. There are so many arguments to this. But for you, dear listener, I want you to earn more. I want you not to have that worry, that clenching gut about, holy crap, how long to the next paycheck? Can I balance the credit cards and do the credit card juggle? Can I have fun at work and feel like I'm really being compensated for the awesome job that I do? So on and so forth. And you'll have your own reasons. We want you to tap into that. And this is why the missing 33% is so important. We want you to get into those roles where you can have fulfillment, where you can really shape organisations and the people who are in them and the end for, you know, create great customer outcomes. We want you to have that, but you have to have access to this information, which by and large, women have been denied access to since women started occupying the workforce in great numbers. Okay, so I want to go back to Susan came up with this definition and published her findings on this back in 2010. And we're in 2023. What's different? What's the same? What do we need to know as an update here? Thinking about, you know, we've been doing this work in the network and the podcast for, for several years now. So what's the same is that 97% of women are still not receiving career advice that is related to achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. I ran a session with a group of women in December 2022 and asked my usual question, tell me the best career advice you've ever received. And as always, 97% of the advice was around using the greatness in you and engaging the greatness in others. Two areas that women are already either equal to or outperform men on. Only 3% of the women, and I'm really scratching for that, only 3% had advice around achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. And if you're wondering what that career advice looks like, folks, if you're saying, well, okay, now I'm going to talk to my boss, my mentor, I'm going to look for stuff. This is the, the kind of stuff we want you to get. We want you to hear advice and, by the way, give advice to women. Learn the business of your business. How does your business make money and what's your role in making more money? How to take action based on the financial reports. All of us get financial reports in our organisation. If you're not getting it, get them. No matter what your position in the organisation. If you're a career start, middle or senior, act like a passionate business owner, which means you know your business inside and out and you know your role, your positional purpose, what they pay you to do around here in taking the business forward. That's the kind of advice we want you to get. So that's what hasn't changed. What has changed, Mel? I don't know if it's changed or been more emphasised I see more of my male colleagues being more interested in elements of engaging the greatness in others, particularly around creating and sustaining high-performing diverse teams or teams with people from diverse communities. And I think that's a really good thing because these are 21st century leadership skills. So I see greater emphasis on that, particularly in my diversity, equity and inclusion work. And I think the other thing that has changed, and particularly at the, I call it the top end of town, so the very large mature organisations, particularly those who are uh, publicly listed and who have a broad range of shareholders, including some activist shareholders, they are looking, as I said earlier in the, in the episode, they're really closely scrutinising the ESG 
and the two uh, the ESG goals and the performance of the organisation. And two clear things come out in that, a real focus on what are you doing around climate and climate change, what are you doing around women and gender equity. So those are the things, and I think they're more macro trends, and I'm pleased to see that they're now rippling out, particularly in my geography here in Australia. We've had a big aha moment in the last couple of years around climate change, but also a real reckoning about it's just not good enough not to have women in leadership anymore. So they're the things that are changing. And, you know, I think the work that we do, that Susan does, and and so many of our other colleagues around DEI in the world, perhaps it's starting to come to fruition. But we really have to dig in into these three layers and particularly really help women build their capacity and their capability to have and demonstrate those critical skills. I'm so glad to see it too. My dogs are a little excited in the background. Is that too loud? It's very, it's very authentic. (laughs) Thank you for joining us, Koki. I just wanted to point out that gender equality shows up as the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal number five. It's number five out of 17. And so it's really great to see the these larger corporations that are aligning their sustainability programs or their ESG programs to the UN SDGs. This ends up helping it be more kind of front and center in that work. So it's very cool. And I, and I think what's really important about this, Mel, and I'm unashamedly bringing this back to the work that you and I do, it's great to have the goal, it's great to have the vision, but let, let's just not throw women into the deep end. Let's create the enablers for them to be successful. And those enablers are access to that critical information and training and skill development. So I recognize we're, we're coming up on time here. I want to say that, of course, we're going to have a learning opportunities inside our network that you can access. And we're also going to host our second annual live in-person event that you can attend in Madison, Wisconsin in 2023. And Michelle, let's talk about what one woman did. So we had an attendee who... Her company would typically sponsor selected leaders to go to this one leadership program. And she looked at the program and she said, you know, that's not really the program that I want or think that I need right now. I think I need this other program. And so she put it in front of her leadership and said, this is the one that I want to go to. And they sent her. We're really proud to say that she had such a great experience that she's coming back and bringing more people with her. So we're really serious about this. We're serious about taking action, equipping you with what you need to make whatever adjustments need to be made so you can reach the goals that you have. This isn't about us trying to push you to become a CEO. This is about you reaching the highest goals that you want to reach. This is about you getting to retirement age and being able to look back and say, I fucking did that. Yeah. (laughs) And being able to say, I have choice. If people have asked me over the course of my life, they've, they've said, gee, you're really driven. And I am very driven. And what drives you? And I've really had to think about that, but it's choice, Mel, because I've been in times of my life, as have you, and we've, we've talked about that, where we haven't had choice. And it's largely rested on a lack of economic or financial choice. I want choice. I want to close out with a couple of things. Number one, the work that we do on this podcast, in our community, with our summits, where we write, where we show up and talk and teach and facilitate is all around enabling women to gain and demonstrate those critical skills so that they can live a prosperous life well lived. That's number one. Number two, action for you right now, listeners. I want you to identify your missing 33%. So know our leadership definition. But what is it? For some of you, it might be personal greatness. For some, it might be engaging the greatness in others. But I know that for many of you, It will be business, strategic and financial acumen or a part thereof. Identify it and take action to close it. We can help you with that. Make sure you're getting the right advice. So think about conventional wisdom given to women, confidence, how to show up, blah, 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 and say, 
I want to get the right advice now to take me forward. The next thing on the list is talk to other women about this. Share this podcast. Tell them about our community, A Career That Soars. Bring her forward. Talk to your women's network about this. This is so important, folks. And the last thing, please give us a star rating. Share the podcast. We love it if you do that because it's really important. That's all from me. (laughs) Yeah, share the podcast. Share the event and opportunities to learn. Michelle, Susan, Amal, myself, we really all sit in a mindset of there is plenty of opportunity to go around. There's so much important work to be done in this world. There's plenty of opportunity and a rising tide lifts all ships. So bring other women into the fold. Join us. We want to see you. I love that expression. Rising tide lifts all ships. It's just such a good, I'm very visual as you know, Mel. Love it. Okay. That's us. (laughs) Woohoo. Thanks for joining us, listeners. And hey, we want to tell you that the next few episodes are going to be uh, some best of episodes. So you're going to hear some uh, best of earlier episodes. And we're also going to throw in a couple of the lives that Michelle and I have done. We've never taken one of the lives and turned it into a podcast. So we're going to throw some of those in every now and then. And you'll get to hear those in case you don't catch them when we're doing them in real time. So that's coming up. Thank you again so much for joining us. And thanks, Michelle. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Mel. Uru. Thank you for downloading Lead to Soar. We so appreciate your support in the form of subscribing, rating, and reviewing the Lead to Soar podcast. We especially appreciate when you share Lead to Soar with friends and colleagues. Lead to Soar is hosted and produced by Michelle Redfern and Mel Butcher. To get in touch with either, visit michelleredfern.com and melbutcher.com. Lead to Soar is a production of A Career That Soars. Learn more at leadtosoar.com. Until next time, stay focused and lead on.